Okay, everyone. We are headed into our tech panel. Um, when I mentioned at the top of this meeting that we could probably do an entire symposium on one panel alone, this one really came to mind. Um, it was very, very hard to narrow down who we were going to bring on to this today, but I'm very pleased to introduce our panelists. And I'm going to pass it off to Mr. Jay Lazaro of NOAA. Jay, take it away. Thanks, Tanner. Do uh, you hear me all right? Sound great. Great. Uh, as Tanner mentioned, my name is Jay Lazar. I work with NOAA's Chesapeake Bay office. When I was asked to introduce the Emerging Technologies panel, I reflected on the breadth of opportunities that these talks represent and the significance of the challenges we as a society will need to overcome in the next several decades. NOAA's Office of Aquaculture states, marine aquaculture enhances coastal resiliency, creates jobs, improves food security, and is a valuable tool to help rebuild some protected species and habitats. These same benefits are derived from the oyster restoration effort well underway in Chesapeake Bay, as you just heard from the previous talks on ecosystem services. The next four speakers you will hear demonstrate a willingness to explore new ways of thinking about how we accomplish aquaculture and restoration monitoring needs. In some cases, they address a, low carbon, a lower carbon future. Others create opportunities for citizen scientists, uncrewed systems, and artificial intelligence as they all look to enhance or document the enhancement of our ecosystems and economies. Often it seems we are given the false dichotomy of improving one at the expense of the other. Our speakers will dare to challenge that notion and hopefully captivate your imagination while they do it. So with that, I'd like to welcome uh, your first speaker, uh, sorry, uh, Steve Pattison of Solar Oysters. All right, very good. Can uh, everyone hear me and see this screen? You can. You are not in presentation mode, however. There you go. Thanks, All right, Steve. very good. Well, thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Um, again, my name is Steve Pattison, and I'm here today to present to you a, a new innovative technology that we call the Solar Oyster Production System. Solar Oysters is a partnership between two companies, the Ecologics Group and Maritime Applied Physics Corporation. I won't go through all these bullet points. Uh, many of them have been discussed by prior presenters. I, I will just remind everyone that Tanner uh, pointed out in his remarks at the very beginning of our goal to have 10 billion oysters in the Bay by 2025. The technology that I'll overview today is a way to help get us to that goal. So again, uh, what you're seeing here, this is a depiction of what we call the Solar Oyster Production System or the acronym of SOPS. This is a floating platform, a high production, high density floating platform. Uh, this particular model is less than 8,500 square foot in uh, its footprint. Uh, the solar energy that is uh, provided by these panels shown here on the top uh, provides the energy to be able to automate uh, what we call these various ladder systems. These ladders have baskets that extend down below the platform vertically. And through the solar energy, there is enough power to rotate the baskets, uh, again, in a loop, uh, thereby exposing the oysters to a variety of food availability and oxygen and salinity levels throughout the water column. And again, oysters are brought to the surface uh, on top of the platform with uh, exposure to uh, workers for harvesting or for seeding or for a biofoul control or for sorting. This particular design uh, done by Maritime Applied Physics uh, also has enough energy to be able to power upwellers or oyster sorting equipment, as well as other ancillary systems such as water quality monitoring or if you need oxygenation, platform surveillance and also navigation lighting. This particular design uh, we estimate could generate on an annual basis up to 2.4 million oysters. So again, just to remind everyone, a very small footprint relative to many traditional oyster float farms and a very high production capability. And again, as we've heard in prior speakers, uh, in Maryland at least, uh, oyster aquaculture can generate nutrient credits. And again, if this particular platform were to be used, uh, again, based on current nutrient credit prices, which again is a fluctuating market, we estimate that a grower with one platform could generate an additional upwards of $50,000 a year in revenue. 
This is designed for deeper water. Uh, this particular platform would uh, most be accommodated in depths of greater than 20 feet. We feel that this kind of a platform affords an opportunity perhaps to avoid some of those more nearshore user conflicts. Again, this is a view kind of from the, from the side uh, for a sense of perspective. We show two individuals here. Um, we feel that this particular platform could be operated by two individuals, probably with one additional supervisor. This is showing a, a little bit more detail on this rotation. Again, powered by the solar energy. What's showing here to the left is one of these, what we call ladder ladders that's in this platform. This particular platform has 48 ladders with uh, 180 baskets extended under each one. These are standard 29 inch in length uh, Hexel baskets. And again, the way this is set up, uh, the rotation, if you look at this middle profile, the baskets uh, again come up and they're easily exposed to the worker for, uh, for again, for sorting, for harvesting or whatnot. And as you see here, there's this rotation of the baskets for a tumbling feature that we're thinking, again, based on input from others, that this could very well result in enhanced shell growth, uh, perhaps a thicker shell, and, and perhaps even a deeper cup in the shell, which makes the product more amenable to the half shell market. Uh, what's shown in the right here is a little bit closer depiction of the power wash system that Maritime Applied Physics has incorporated into this design. Uh, again, this will all be powered by the solar energy that's provided by the solar panels. What I'm showing here is what we call the small version, small SOPs, if you will. Uh, this particular design is about 40 by 25 feet. Um, again, it has the basic same operating um, in it, uh, powered by solar energy, uh, smaller, obviously. This particular model, as we, uh, we call the small SOPs, is something that we feel has potential both for the restoration market and for oyster aquaculture. In fact, we are in the process of building a platform of this type. It should be uh, in the water. We're shooting for the end of August and be operational. You know, I'm proud to say that we're in a partnership with the Chesapeake Bay Foundation and the oysters that will be grown from this platform, which will be sited offshore of maritime applied physics in the Baltimore Harbor, those oysters will be used as part of CBF's oyster gardening program in the harbor and those oysters taken to a reef uh, near the Fort Carroll area at the mouth of the Baltimore Harbor. This particular model um, is probably best at depths of 18 feet or, or greater. Again, you could adjust uh, the number of baskets um, underneath the platform for shallower applications. We estimate based on this design that this particular platform could grow upwards of 200,000 oysters annually. And as you heard in a, the prior presentation from Dr. Cornwell, that uh, there are efforts um, currently that potentially for oyster restoration, the nutrient credits could be generated from that activity. Again, as, uh, as two Maryland companies, we're very committed to uh, using this technology to not only help the oyster aquaculture industry, but also help in the restoration effort here in the Bay. And so we've, we've had an ongoing dialogue since the conception of this, uh, this technology with both the Chesapeake Bay Foundation, as well as the Oyster Recovery Partnership to try to find opportunities where this could be used throughout the Bay. And I should point out that uh, it's important that wherever it is potentially to be cited, that the uh, appropriate uh, regulatory approvals are secured, be it either a lease or a permit or a DNR lease uh, or license. Again, just another uh, view of this, all marine grade parts um, incorporated into this. The uh, boxes, if you will, shown on the side would, would incorporate battery packs or other storage that's needed for tools or other implements in the platform. And again, this platform has five ladders, total of 660 baskets. Again, just another showing of the dimensions of this small SOPS unit that we're building right now. Uh, and as shown here with the baskets uh, designed on this particular depiction, uh, they extend down about 16 feet below the platform, below the water, the water surface. Uh, again, potentially it could be accommodated for shallower areas with, uh, with fewer baskets extended underneath it. So just to wrap it up in conclusion, we feel that again, this technology has a, a number of areas where it adds value, both in terms of the increased production of oysters on a very small footprint compared to traditional methods. It is an opportunity to really maximize or leverage labor, uh, perhaps a lower labor cost, certainly a more amenable 
work environment for those in the, uh, the harvesting business. And of course, it is a, an automated process to grow oysters using the solar power, which really advances sustainability and stewardship for the oyster aquaculture industry. And of course, I think we all know of the filtration capabilities of oysters resulting in uh, you know, cleaner water and also being able to generate more oysters for, uh, for planting on reefs that adds to the, the overall ecosystem of the bay. You know, the, the aquaculture industry is kind of depicted at the bottom of this slide as something that uh, really has not seen much automation over the last 100 to 150 years. So this is an opportunity we feel to provide something that really helps advance the industry. Again, I, I want to thank everyone for the opportunity to be here today. We do have, uh, you could go to solaroysters.com or solaroysters.org. We do have a two minute animated video that uh, time didn't allow to show that today, but I would encourage you to go visit that. And lastly, I, I just want to point out, even though today I may be kind of the face of our project, there's a number of individuals that have really been critical to our success uh, to get us to this point. Uh, we're very anxious to get a platform in the water and really kind of prove this technology, see where we need to improve it. Uh, but in particular, I want to acknowledge uh, the contributions of Dr. Bob Summers from Ecologics, Rebecca Borgert from Ecologics, as well as Mark um, Rice, the president of Maritime Applied Physics, Elizabeth Hines and Richard Frost from Maritime Applied Physics and others that are uh, too countless to name at this point. So again, I'll leave it at that and I thank you for the opportunity. Hey, thanks, Steve. Um, that is an inspiring uh, development that you have there as the uh, questions in the uh, question and answer box uh, uh, suggest. Um, Feel free to take a look at some of those while we move on to our next speakers, but save maybe some of the juicier ones for, uh, for a little bit later on when we have the uh, Q&A for everybody. Um, next up is Brad King. Brad's the Executive Director of the Marine Science Foundation. Take it away, Brad. Thank you, Jay. All right, everyone. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks for having me today. Um, Marine Science Foundation is a relatively new organization. Um, we're on the eastern shore of Maryland, and we focus primarily on engineering um, capability development uh, focused towards marine science. We're made up largely of uh, former capability development folks, engineers of uh, all backgrounds from the Department of Defense. And that's relative to us because a lot of our focus um, after retired careers and existing careers in the Department of Defense, we recognize there's a lot of technology that uh, would be relevant uh, in the marine science community. We focus a lot of our energy on quantitative data um, to go along with some of the qualitative uh, information that's out there. So uh, a lot of our capabilities are either transferred from the military and, and, and intelligence community, Department of Defense, um, and then some, is, some uh, capabilities are just sort of uh, put together uh, alongside, uh, alongside of those technologies that we're actually transferring. Um, we also work uh, to transition that technology over to marine scientists in the field, traditional marine scientists. So helping them uh, uh, analyze the data, fuse the data and, and develop patterns of, of, uh, that may be emerging. Hey, Brad. Is this, I don't think we're seeing your screen over here. I thought it might have just been me, but I've gotten a ping. Is it, is it up yet? I don't see it. Oh, I got it. Sorry to interrupt. No, no, thank you for interrupting. Thank you. <laughs> You're I, uh, welcome. And uh, I it would guess it's been a pretty boring time just listening to me speak. We're going to full screen <laughs> mode and we'll be all set. How's that? Yeah. Uh, that is it. Here we go. So, some of the things, how about that for a technology guy? I can't get the slides up. Um, machine learning uh, and artificial intelligence is sort of at the heart of everything today. Um, data fusion and modeling we partner a lot of things are happening in the cloud now we're paying for service so we partner a lot with uh, organizations like amazon web service um, for bringing in large data sets and ingesting those data sets and data lakes so data formatting in the past from disparate uh, databases bespoke 
data sets can now be ingested very, very quickly in a matter of minutes. And we can crawl through that data very quickly to develop models. And using machine learning and art artificial intelligence allows us to see things that, that we may not have, have entered in our previous queries. Um, so, so that's one of our big focuses. And that's, that's very much a, a intelligence community, big data model and analysis capability that we've transferred over using their methods and best practices. Remote sensing is a big thing for us that we transfer, transferred over. Um, technology's changed quite a bit on the, on the capability development side of the house. So FPGA, software defined radios, um, paper service, high performance computing is now allowing us to do quite a bit more than what, what, we've, uh, what we've traditionally been able to do with products off the shelf or COTS capabilities as we, as we call them. We look at things uh, like alternative precision navigation and precision timing uh, in non-GPS based functions. And those do uh, quite a bit of, of, of uh, things for us on the, on the multispectral remote sensing side. So a lot of leave behind and persistent monitoring. Um, we're big on uh, data sampling theory. So uh, sampling data over long periods of time helps us build those patterns. Those persistent monitoring tools that we've developed are both digital arrays um, to measure and, and test not only just water temperature and the typical water quality effects that you would get from a sonde or other water quality monitoring tools, but also pressure changes to determine whether that, um, that can be tested just on the digital array itself versus having to put in a $20,000 piece of of remote monitoring equipment. If we can reduce the cost of persistent monitoring, then I put that in the hands of, of the marine science uh, organizations and that would be, uh, be more affordable to, to put leave behind persistent sensors in. And those would help us with precursor detection and predictive modeling. That's where we're headed with the artificial intelligence and machine learning on our end. Um, Things like underwater archaeology uh, for change detection and reflect, retroreflective surfaces are the things that we're working on, uh, degradation materials, things like that. Um, so back to the nitrogen and, 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 and other issues that were talked about in the uh, previous uh, panel, those would be things we'd like to be able to detect based on those uh, pressure changes. Um, we do bring over those best practices we've talked about. Um, that's comes from either the intelligence community, the military, or DOD, um, such as data fusion and processing. Back in, the, uh, back in the olden days, that had to be done via uh, large data centers, computer centers. Now with AWS, you can just have that set up in a matter of minutes, have your data engineered, uh, run it through large process engines, and, and get a result for hundreds of dollars or thousands of dollars a month versus millions of dollars. Uh, we do advanced at data analytics uh, from everything from on using ontologies and pulling those uh, to uh, other models such as uh, temporal analysis. Uh, and then of course, back to the predictive component, sentiment analysis, things like that. Data immutability is a big one for us for open, uh, open data sharing. We have a goal of trying to democratize uh, access to data. So everything that we collect, we put in open source and make it available for others so that um, other research communities, uh, marine scientists, they can access the data and, and research it themselves without, um, without having to, to go around and, and, and collect these disparate sets of data themselves. So by making data immutable, people that do collect data or if we collect data and ingest it, no one can then change it or affect it. You can just use it and see it, but you can't uh, use it and then turn it around, uh, modify it in some way. Uh, the artificial intelligence and machine learning piece we kind of touched on. And then of course, the metadata and ontology component allow us to leave data processing remotely and then just look at getting the metadata back for triggering and, si and signature uh, information. So some of our data analytics models. The persistent monitoring stuff is the multi-parameter sensor tools that we develop in-house. Uh, some of our goals are to be able to make those tools inexpensive as we discussed before 
And some of those sensors that we develop, uh, we make open source so that other engineering departments can have access to those and pare them down as they, as they need. The goal is to have a full cap fully capable sond below the price point of about $2,000 in the next year. Uh, 15 minute interval data collections, that's our sample theory. So if we could collect every 15 minutes um, in a small footprint and had that data either sent back or remotely accessed. Um, monthly maintenance, of course, for biofouling, that's our typical stuff, but uh, having those sensors heads cleaned uh, and then left behind. The open, open source data repository is that AWS data lake we discussed. Um, so collecting data that's legacy uh, and then also collecting data towards the future to develop those predictive models. And then of course the change detection engine over time. Uh, and that's uh, as quick as I can make that without boring everyone to death. Right, thanks Brad. Let's keep things moving along here. I'll say next up we have Martin Kazacek. Martin's the program manager in the Emerging Capabilities Division at Northrop Grumman. Take it away, Martin. Hi, how's it going? Um, so let me just make sure I've got the right charts up. You guys see it in presentation mode, all good? Yes, it's there, thank you. Okay, great. So um, yeah, thank you for the introduction, Jay, and thank you for inviting us. It's a, it's a pleasure to, to participate. So um, as Jay mentioned, um, I'm Martin Kozacek. I'm a program manager at Northrop Grumman um, Mission Systems here in Baltimore. Um, and you know, essentially what I wanna talk about is um, an innovation challenge that we started in, in collaboration with the Chesapeake Bay Foundation, um, aiming to create a suite of um, remote sensing capabilities that could help the, the scientists at the CBF essentially assess um, the health of the reef ecosystem. So we approach this from a multimodal perspective rather than just simply um, doing sonar scans or, or image grabs, things of that nature. We tried to come up with a, a set of tools and equipment that could be used to assess, to, to find, localize, um, monitor the health of the reef, and then actually provide some quanted, some detailed assessment of um, what's going on on the reefs. And, and particularly in the Chesapeake Bay, this is a, a difficult environment, unlike some of the environments that we traditionally operate in. The water is very murky, turbid. It's hard to see, as I'm sure most of you know. So um, this is a quick timeline of the project. I'm not going to go into tremendous detail, um, but suffice it to say, this is work that's been done by Northrop engineers um, on a part-time basis um, in collaboration with Doug and Allison at the CBF. Um, we launched this as an internally funded innovation challenge. Um, back in 2019, um, trying to develop the different sensing modalities that would be suitable um, in helping the CBF monitor um, their progress as they strive towards the $10 billion oyster goal. Um, we did some initial sensor development back in 2019, and I'll talk about that um, here in a bit. Um, you know, last year, we, we aimed to do a lot of further development and maturation of those system concepts. Obviously, COVID kind of kept us off the water until very late in the year. Um, and so, you know, right now we're in a mode um, working jointly with CBF, having secured funding to actually move from a kind of a breadboard um, benchtop prototype um, stage to actually building deployable systems um, that the CBF can take over um, in the later part of this year. So as I mentioned, we're working on this more as a holistic approach, right? So um, there are many different ways that you can remotely monitor underwater environments. Um, and they each offer their pros and cons um, in a specific environment. So what we wanted to do is equip the, the CBF, and, and now it's actually including a, a larger um, a coalition of, of scientists at NOAA and Smithsonian, um, to be able to basically rapidly survey this, the, uh, the bay bottom or the sea bottom. And, and sonar is typically the tool used. Um, however, sonar has its limitations, uh, both from the perspective of resolution on commercially available systems um, and again, we wanted to make this challenge something where we leverage commercial technologies, right? The, the kind of systems that we typically develop um, are not really applicable from a cost and, and development time perspective for organizations like CBF and are not easily scalable. We are, we are not a, a producer of commercial technologies. So we wanted to leverage commercial sensing. So essentially fish finding or um, commercially available side scan um, but unlike um, the traditional application where you essentially can pull together and stitch back the, the sonar data, it, it's difficult to, to process. So we've actually developed a, a neural network which can be trained initially by synthetic data 
um, which we've developed, and now by actual known and uh, bottom truth um, oyster reefs. And in turn, this can provide CBF or, or any other user in this case, um, the ability to deploy a commercial sonar, rapidly map sea bottom, which you can just tow behind a small vessel, um, and then very quickly and eventually in the actually processing in the cloud, provide you a segmented and classified um, image of that reef. So while it can't count the oysters because the sonar does not have that resolution, um, it can quickly based on rugosity, and, and later I'll, I'll talk more about how that measurement is informed by um, other modalities, give you a, a kind of a segmentation of what it believes is a reef versus um, scattered, um, you know, scattered substrate or, or things of that nature. Um, so again, it's, it's more of a, a honing in tool for figuring out where um, reefs are and then assessing their size. Um, moving on with the passive acoustics, um, there's research that shows that um, oysters um, and other organisms actually respond positively um, to a, you know, what can be qualified as a healthy um, acoustic sound, soundscape. So much like a forest, right, when you walk into a very healthy forest, you hear birds, squirrels, chipmunks, things of that nature, which um, leads you to believe that it is a healthy ecosystem. Um, the marine environment is very much similar. So we've developed systems um, based on just commercially available hydrophones, um, which, which are tuned to the specific broadband and narrowband frequencies, which can be used to capture the acoustic environment or soundscape of a reef. And again, we've trained those systems, or we, we are actually in the process of training that. Um, this takes significant labeled data um, to learn initially in aggregate what a healthy reef sounds like. So we're deploying that in, um, in Harris Creek, or we will be deploying that in Harris Creek with the CBF to capture data, which can be labeled and used to train um, the neural network to determine whether a reef is qualitatively healthy or unhealthy. And furthermore, as we capture specific signatures of things like oyster toadfish or snapping shrimp, um, the presence of which indicates, again, a healthy reef, we can um, narrow in on the processing and actually detect those organisms specifically, which then further support the hypothesis that a given reef is, um, is healthy. So this is meant as a, um, a small deployable buoy with a suspended acoustic payload, which could be augmented with chemistry data as well, um, which can be deployed across different points on the reef as informed by the sonar scan and enables them to collect data and then report um, back a qualitative metric of oyster health, as well as in the long run, the presence of any indicator species. And the, so the last component is, is imaging. And this is perhaps one of the, the more challenging things to do in the Chesapeake. Um, obviously there are multitudes of commercially available cameras like GoPros and things of that nature, which can be deployed at very low costs and great scale. However, the problem just comes that at least the ways we've seen it deployed historically, it's, it's a static deployment. There isn't the ability to do real-time processing and you kind of get what you get. There, there's very limited ability to improve the image quality and, and tune it in real time. Um, so we've been experimenting with a, a light field camera um, or also known as a planoptic camera, um, which is a, a different kind of a, it's still an optical camera. It uses a traditional um, sensor. However, instead of a single fixed focal length lens, um, it uses an array of lenses in front of it which allows it to capture images across all the different focal lengths simultaneously, um, and then be able to reconstruct not only a three-dimensional image, so you can essentially extract a, a three-dimensional um, uh, sort of bathymetric uh, map of what you're looking at, um, but because you have that single image um, captured, you can essentially recreate a, a fully focused image, which is more conducive to dehazing, meaning you can see better in the murky water. Um, it's not going to give you that National Geographic quality of images we may be used to or accustomed to, which can be done with, with diver-assisted equipment in tremendous amount of time, but um, it enables a, a higher rate or um, higher rate of scan and then also a higher probability of capturing really high quality images, which can be processed in real time. Um, so again, this is a system that we've done some development with, um, with an older uh, heritage camera and um, again, through partnership with the CBF, um, we're working to deploy that on a remotely controlled rover, um, which will enable us to enable some of that processing in the real time using um, a remotely um, embedded GPU. So again, th this suite of, of hardware and software is intended to provide the CBF a toolkit by which um, they can map a reef, figure out points of interest where they want to specifically go down and do some selective imaging, um, and essentially come back with a, with a report that they can update over time. Um, I, I would want to add that we, we did look at LIDAR imaging at one point in time, and we had some good successes with it. 
Um, however, the system that we developed um, was a Geiger mode LiDAR proved to be too expensive and, and quite unwieldy for this application. Um, I think that as commercial LiDAR sensors come down in price, um, that'll definitely be um, another toolkit as it, it really enables you to penetrate um, turbid and murky waters with much greater um, results than, than optics. So the, the plans moving forward, um, as I mentioned, 19 and 20 were spent largely in the lab and, and out on the water, but with you know, really prototype breadboard kind of equipment. Um, now in 21, um, all of our systems are progressing to kind of what we're calling a Mark II, so really fieldable, scalable prototype. Um, again, Northrop doesn't intend to mass produce these, but our intention is to work with folks like um, CERC, CBF, NOAA, um, to come up with a, with a design that can be scaled um, and then eventually we hope to port a lot of the, the processing and data storage into the cloud. Um, so we're engaging with folks like Microsoft um, using their Azure cloud as a potential way of not only storing the data once it's integrated into ArcGIS, but also porting some of that neural net capability so that everyone can essentially do this, right? It won't be limited to the folks who are literally working here, um, here with us. So um, in closing, I don't know how I'm doing on time here, um, this project is a part of um, what we call technology for conservation. It's, it's one of uh, a multitude of initiatives at Northrop Grumman where we are using to leverage the technology, the know-how um, that we've developed for our traditional defense customers and look at for sort of that overlap in the Venn diagram of um, needs and capabilities in the conservation community. Um, we're constantly looking for opportunities for further partnerships. So we encourage everyone to, to reach out and um, connect with us um, and obviously, um, you know, look for, for further opportunities to, to do good more work like this. So, thank you. Thank you, Martin. <clears throat> uh, really cool stuff. And I look forward to the developments to come. Uh, last, we have Allison Tracy. Uh, Allison's a postdoctoral fellow at the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center. And the uh, floor is yours, Allison. Great, so I'm just gonna put this in full screen. Can you guys see the presenter mode or the normal mode? Perfectly, okay. presenter mode. Great, all right, so hi everyone. I'm Allison Tracy, I'm a postdoctoral fellow at Smithsonian Environmental Research Center or CERC and today I'll be telling you about some of the insights we're gaining into oyster ecology and management using rapid assessment approaches. So for our research purposes, uh, Chesapeake Bay oyster restoration is a valuable and unprecedented experiment. I saw somebody just put link to this effect in the chat. And uh, really this is helpful for us because it's creating a mosaic of harvested and non-harvested sites across the bay, as well as restored sites within those harvest, uh, non-harvested areas. So we can compare oysters and reefs at these sites to learn about oyster ecology. Our goal at CERC is to use this unique setup or experiment to ask a pressing question about oyster ecology, and that is, what are the combined effects of management and environment on oyster reef health? So for example, we wanna know if harvest and restoration sites have different effects in um, higher, and low salinity, higher and lower salinity regions of the bay. So we're using new technology to answer this question more effectively and more quickly than we could have before. Oh, just a second. having a little bit of a, okay, there we go. Uh, can you guys still see the right screen? Yes, but you have gone back to um, um, the presentation mode. Okay, yeah, that's what I thought happened. I'll just swap it back. Um, okay, now how does it look? It, it went back. It's normal? No, it went back. Okay, oh, just a second. Okay, how about that? That's it. Okay. Cool. So we're using this. We're using this setup to. Uh, we're using rapid assessment methods to study these questions more effectively and more quickly than we could have before. And in brief, what I'll tell you about today is data we've collected on oyster habitat as a metric of oyster health, which we're using um, to study, uh, which we're using, which we're studying across the bay on all of these 12 tributaries, which include the 10 restoration tributaries in white here and two comparison harvested tributaries in each state. So we characterize the habitat at all of these at, um, as a metric of reef health because we know taller, more three-dimensional reefs are critical for reef persistence and as well, of course, ecosystem services and biodiversity. 
And here you can see an example of a high structure reef on the left and a low structure reef on the right. So the reason we need a rapid approach is because we're trying to survey a lot of different sites across the bay, and we want to be able to do that in a relatively short amount of time. The Fisheries Conservation Lab at CERC has developed a tool to be able to do this that uses a GoPro frame with uh, uh, go, three GoPro cameras, as you can see here, with a PVC frame and dive, week, dive weight. So these are all pretty cheap ingre uh, ingredients or components. And the two bottom videos take uh, images laterally along the bottom of the reef, while this top camera faces downwards and takes time-lapse images of the quadrat. And as Martin mentioned, water, cl water clarity is a big issue in the Chesapeake Bay, so we primarily use this method in fall and spring when it's clear. We've, in order to assess these images, we've developed a scoring system that relies on percent cover and vertical structures. So a zero on the scoring system is no oysters. That's pretty straightforward. A one is less than 50% cover. So there's just a smattering of oysters. A two is more than 50% cover with height of, of less than one adult oyster. And a three is more than 50% cover with the height of, oops, height of more than one adult oyster. So for the biological community, we superimpose a 10 by 10 grid on these quadrat photos, and we can look at the percent cover of various types of organisms, which is another metric of reef health. How many organisms is it supporting? The Fisheries Conservation Lab recently published a peer-reviewed manuscript on this method, and what you can see here is just an example figure from this manuscript showing that we're successfully recovering more sites with a score of three at restored sanctuaries in comparison to harvested areas of two types and unrestored sanctuaries. So what you can see here, we're applying this rapid assessment method to these 12 tributaries that I mentioned at the beginning to be able to survey 600 locations and ask questions about the combined impact of management and ecology. Um, just gonna show you an example here of three of the tributaries and how this actually works. We've randomly selected 50 sites in each tributary based on information on where existing oyster reefs are likely to be, and those that's shown in these green polygons. And we can actually do these 50 sites in a single day for each tributary, which is pretty convenient. So we're gaining a lot of insights into this main research question we have. Today, I'm going to tell you only about the Maryland portion of the data as, I'm, as we speak working on the Virginia tributaries. And this is a subset of 300 sites and six tributaries. So our first hypothesis in applying this rapid assessment method was to, to that we thought oyster habitat scores would be higher for non-harvested reefs, anthropogenic bottom, and higher salinity zones. Interesting, what we, interestingly, what we found was that harvest status was more important than the salinity zone or the restoration status. And when we, when we break this down, you can see the harvested reefs over here, the harvested sites have an overall lower score with more zeros and ones, very few threes, while the non-harvested areas have more threes. And of course, it's also important to note that we do have all four scores in both categories, uh, harvested and non-harvested. Our second hypothesis is that reef-associated organisms would increase with that habitat score. And we actually ended up using the side facing cameras for this instead of the quadrats uh, for water clarity issues. And you can see here that these higher habitat scores of a, a score of three had more complex uh, reefs, they supported more biodiversity with a with greater number of these taxonomic groups. Overall, we're, re really being we're really able to contribute a lot to the existing knowledge on drivers of oyster reef health and emerging technology by using these methods. I've shown you here uh, one application of this method where we found that harvest is the key driver of, of oyster habitat in the Maryland portion of the bay. And environmental conditions weren't so much, but we'll be able to assess this when we have a larger environmental gradient to look at when we add the Virginia site. On the side of emerging technology, I think we can see here that this is a rapid, remote, and relatively inexpensive method that's off the shelf. And I would also like to say that it does complement many of the existing methods for oyster reef monitoring while providing this uh, much needed rapid method uh, or rapid, a rapid tool for um, existing monitoring activities. So far, we've found that this has been a useful uh, tool to apply to monitoring and restoration, not only for the baywide management and oyster restoration groups, but also for local communities that we're working with. So with that, I'd just like to thank the CERC Fisheries Conservation Lab, the Rapid Assessment Work Group that NOAA convened, 
and also CERC and Smithsonian Working Land and Seascapes for funding. And I just have my contact information here if you have any questions. Thanks. Thank you, Allison. So it looks like we have just under 15 minutes for some question and answers. Um, there are a few in the uh, Q&A, but I uh, wanted to kick it back over to Steve and uh, maybe synthesize a few of the questions that were, or at least group them in the, some of the questions that were asked. Um, you know, ecosystem services is something that was discussed uh, in the last panel quite a bit. And I was wondering um, whether or not, uh, I saw that there were some, some nutrient crediting questions and some waste removal uh, questions, but have, have the ecosystem of services uh, from the uh, the SOPS operation been something that's uh, that's been discussed or considered uh, with your group? Well, that's a very good question, and the short answer is is no. I mean, we certainly would be very open and and uh, all ears in terms of how to be how to calculate that or how to factor that into the value of this technology. So, uh, uh, most of our we do have some financial models that are again based on. Uh, performance of the, the platform for aquaculture. Uh, we're continuing to refine those models. Um, and um, again, I, I did mention the nutrient credits. Uh, we have not factored that into our financial models. Uh, we, we view that as kind of an add-on and extra. Uh, we wanna make sure that we bring something to market that really is viable on its own uh, merits as a, as a oyster production system. But um, again, if there's any uh, methodologies or ways that you feel that we should be totally looking at the ecosystem benefits, uh, certainly any information that anyone could provide, we'd be more than happy to look at it. You know, one of the, uh, one of the things I was thinking about when looking at some of the slides from, it was Karen's presentation earlier in the day, and, and this idea of the barge, which goes in the deeper water, is that there are potential trade-offs to aquaculture and shallow water. Um, you, uh, can be occupying uh, space that could be used for uh, SAB growth and, and return. And so uh, I think that there's some really cool potential opportunities by you know, opening those areas that are critical habitats back up and still being able to have an aquaculture um, um, enterprise uh, available. So uh, that's, um, that's, that's, that's pretty cool stuff. Um, the other um, question I had uh, was around permitting, and I wonder if that's something that you could speak to. I'm sure folks are interested in, you know, both being able to get these platforms to the water and then being able to, uh, you know, occupy some space on the water. Is, is have you addressed the permitting um, issues, and yes. or are there issues? Yes, no, I, that's a good point. And I, I didn't dwell on that. I just didn't have time a lot in the presentation. But from the very beginning, and, and this concept uh, was kind of birthed about three years ago. So since that time, we've had extensive dialogue with all the key regulators, both at the state and federal level. We've gone before the state's aquaculture review board three times. We've gone before the joint evaluation committee. And the, the short answer is in Maryland waters, uh, to use this platform for aquaculture, you do need a DNR lease at a minimum. There's other regulatory approvals that are needed. Of course, you need to comply with the National Shellfish Sanitation Program. Um, if the platform is used for restoration, the guidance that we've received is that you would at least need a Maryland uh, Tidal Wetlands license from MDE. And so we do have that in place at the location that we plan to deploy this first platform. So the, the permitting process is something that does need to be factored in. And of course, uh, there could be other jurisdictions. This is a technology that we feel has applicability, not just to the Chesapeake Bay, but we've often uh, got interest in uh, wanting to use this platform in waters outside of Maryland, other areas within the, the US or even internationally. So uh, knowing what the local and jurisdictional permit requirements are is gonna be critical in whatever plans are made to site this platform. Great, Thank, thanks, Steve. Um, Next question uh, comes from the uh, the attendees. Uh, Dr. Rain, Randy Jenka has a, I think a question for you, Brad, about um, the persistent monitoring um, approach, um, the 15-minute sampling period, uh, 
of, you know, what, what do you see uh, that uh, frequency of a monitoring um, being valuable for? That's a great question. So one of the reasons we chose 15 minute uh, sampling, sort of a trade off for um, the types of things we'd be collecting on. So turbidity determining and, and, and measuring that turbidity along with the water quality data to try to overlay any types of relationships in those phenomena. Kind of along the same track that, that Martin was talking about just a little bit earlier with regard to um, making sort of this precursor uh, pattern development so we can start predicting things that are happening or that might happen. Uh, so current shifts, uh, whether that's made up by, uh, you know, artificially uh, on the sensor head itself through boat traffic, or maybe it's just happening and in, in a tidal shift is happening in, in such a shallow body of water like the Chesapeake Bay. Minor things like wind shifts and things like that really kick up the sediment. When we dive, I mean, we're diving the Chesapeake Bay probably five to six days a week um, in different areas. And you can really tell the difference in, a, in something as, as nominal, like down in the, the uh, offshore environments, outer banks, things like that. Little shifts in wind don't really have these major impacts where in, in shallow waters like the bay, they're, they're tremendous. Boat traffic, we see things kick up. And of course, the, the marine life that we track acoustically, we like to be able to sample that every 15 minutes. Um, so we have a longer dwell on the acoustics and then use that data back together. Hope that answers your question, uh, there, Dr. Jenko. No, thank thank you. Uh, you did perfectly, Brad. Um, we got we have a question in here at, uh, for Allison uh, from Olivia Coretti, and uh, this goes to I think a lot of the the concerns, or not even concerns, but the the, the uh, goals of a rapid assessment approach is that data collection oftentimes is and can be, it can be time consuming. It could also be the fasting, but it's the processing end of it that uh, often takes up a lot of uh, additional resources. Um, do you want to address the uh, image processing time required to go through the, uh, the, the images that are collected? Um, and, then, and then maybe if, um, whether you wanna to speak to this or, or possibly Martin might can speak to the, uh, the challenge that Northrop Grumman um, sponsored through the University of Maryland, the, uh, the opportunity for some AI in this field? Yeah, so great question. Um, the imaging, the image processing time is currently something we do manually with the help of actually a great citizen scientist who works with the lab, but it's something we're definitely considering trying to automate because it seems like it has the capacity, has some good criteria for that. So Currently, what we've done will be really useful. We can potentially use that as a training set where we can um, ideally make sure that we can automate it with the same or less error than when we do it manually. And I guess that kind of gets into a little bit more of what Martin's been doing with the University of Maryland Challenge. So I'll kick it over to him to talk about uh, that a little bit more. Sure. Yeah, so last fall, I'm trying to recalibrate myself, um, we had sponsored a university challenge at, at UMD College Park um, in collaboration with, with Allison and um, Jay and CBF, where we essentially fed the students um, libraries of labeled data sets um, of um, depicting oysters, live oysters, dead oysters, open, closed, etc., um, on which they could train various neural networks, um, which then they applied to an unlabeled data set um, to try to determine what was in scene. Um, and I don't have that at my fingertips um, and to, to be able to talk about the, the speed of the processing of the individual capabilities that, I think there were three teams um, that we considered sort of winning um, and that are actually interested in, in participating in further work. Um, so I don't recall exactly the individual processing times um, or, or the, the final um, scores, um, but we, you know, that's definitely information we'd be happy to share. Um, and we are in touch with those students and um, presuming getting back on the water this summer and collecting further images from, from Allison's um, camera arrays and then hopefully our own ROV, um, we would like to, to work with them further um, in you know, creating label data sets um, and then showing how dehazing um, can improve potentially the, the scene extraction and basically finding what's, what's in frame. So um, 
there's definitely work going on in that area and we'd love to you know continue that um, those partnerships thanks thanks martin um if i'm recalling correctly i think uh, some of the teams were able to document 60 to 70 percent uh, accuracy from the top-down views for um, being able to uh, observe the percent cover of shell. Um, I, you know, I, I don't know how that um, ultimately, uh, you know, it, it, whether that's a, I, I feel like that's a pretty promising result given the, given the conditions and the quality of the imagery that a lot of, you know, a lot of times we're faced with, but um, um, I think it's a promising uh, area for, you know, for a lot of these groups to move into really that cutting down on that processing time and that effort uh, is, is truly what will make something, you know, uh, rapid and increase the efficiencies that we're, uh, that we're looking for. Um, all right, I don't see any additional questions in here. Um, and I don't know if anybody has a follow up for any of your other fellow panelists, um, but uh, if not, yeah, can I kick it back over to you, Tanner? Absolutely. And um, thank you all very, very much um, for, for like the science fiction portion, uh, uh, truth is fiction, stranger than fiction uh, portion of the symposium. I think that's fine. It's late in the day. Let's give everybody a nice like nine, 10 minute break. Let's gather back at three o'clock for our final panel. Again, thank you, Jay, and to all of our panelists. We'll see you soon. <laughs>